Good morning. I hope you're all having a great day. I was particularly encouraged this week to hear the news that we have now got two vaccines approved in the United States for fighting the coronavirus. I think the biggest concern that I have now is that this vaccine is distributed in an equitable way around the world, especially those in developing countries, so that our brothers and sisters around the world have a chance to be vaccinated as well. We are in the fourth week of Advent, and during this Sunday, we are transitioning completely to the focus on remembering and observing Jesus's first coming, his incarnation and birth in Bethlehem. Now, if you go back to my first videos on Advent, the introduction, I'll have a link over here that you can go back and take a look at. I mentioned how Advent has really two focuses to it. It comes from the Latin Adventus, which means return or arrival. And in the New Testament, it is predominantly used to speak about Christ's second return. And that's really where Advent got its start. It was a season to prepare ourselves and to look forward to Christ's second return. But then once Christmas got tacked onto the end of Advent, then they had a problem because how do you have a period like Lent of fasting, prayer, and repentance that leads up to the joyous remembrance of Jesus' birth? And so what they did in church tradition and theology and history is it started with this focus on Christ's second return and then as we go through the four weeks, it slowly shifts to remembering and observing Jesus' first birth. And John the Baptist in weeks two and three really is a transitional figure that moves us from looking at Christ's second return to his first return. This week, we are looking straight at Christ's first return. And in particular, this week's reading focuses on Luke 26 through 38, which is the story of the Annunciation to Mary that she will be the mother of Jesus. Now I had to go back and look it up because three years ago in the Washington Post, they had a story about a high school that denied a senior the right to graduation because she was pregnant, even though she had a 4.0 GPA. And the school's logic behind this was, we're not denying her graduation because she's pregnant, but because she's immoral. This might seem like a pretty extreme example, but I think it betrays two things. The first off is how guilt and shame are often so much part of the underlying structure and social ethos of the Christian church. And the second thing it brings out is how women, especially young women, bear the brunt of our social mores within our culture today. Focus on the family, even as late as last year, in one of their publications addressed this issue. And they said that the problem isn't that there aren't unwed young women within the church. There are, they argued, or there were. The problem, they argued, is that because of the guilt and shame associated with this, young women that find themselves with unplanned pregnancies often leave the church or are forced out of them. So how does all this fit with the fourth Sunday of Lent? Well, let's grab a cup of coffee and we're gonna dig in and find out. If you're new to the channel, you're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 to 30 years, I've been teaching in seminary and other institutions around the world on issues related to biblical interpretation and New Testament studies. And the goal of this channel is to break the four walls of the classroom wide open and take what I've been teaching in seminary and make it available to anyone on the platform of YouTube. So if you like the channel, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with other people, and also leave a comment down below if you have a question or idea about what I talk about in these videos. I love to hear them and read them. We have two accounts of Jesus' birth in the New Testament. In Matthew, we have the account of Joseph, his dream or approach by the angel, the Magi and the Herod. It focuses upon men and movers and shakers within society. Mark and John have no record at all of Jesus' birth. But then in Luke, we have another account of Jesus' birth. This time though, Luke focuses upon women and people that are on sort of the fringes of society. In particular, Luke focuses upon Elizabeth, Mary's relative, 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then Anna in the temple. You also have the story of Simon in the temple and the shepherds who really represent other people that are on sort of the fringes of society. I'm going to break this story in Luke, verses 26 through 38 of chapter 1, into sort of four acts. And each one is based upon a statement from the angel or actions by the angel and then Mary's response. The fourth one is not really part of our reading this week, but it shows Mary's reaction to everything that takes place here. So let's dive into this. In Act 1, we have the announcement of the angel. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin promised to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by his words and began to wonder about the meaning of this greeting. Now, the way the story is written here gives us this impression that we see in artworks of this very tranquil, peaceful scene. And the angel just kind of shows up and Mary just seems to accept it and talk to him like a normal person. When in reality, when we look at the biblical account, angels were incredibly fearful creatures. If you read Isaiah or Ezekiel, is something that is completely out of this world. So when this angel shows up to Mary, you can imagine her going, what the fork? You know, this would have just totally startled her. This would have been something completely out of the blue that she would have never expected. What, I'm not allowed to say fork on my own channel? Well, that's crazy. Now there's a couple other things to realize here. Earlier in the chapter, the angel appeared to Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, while he is serving in the temple in Jerusalem. That's where you would expect an angel to appear. But for the angel to go to where Mary is in the little town of Nazareth, that's completely countercultural. The angel addressing Mary as the favored one is a Greek participle and brings across this idea that she is one upon whom favor has been bestowed, not one who bestows favor upon other people. And so even though she has not done anything in the story yet to deserve it, she is a person who has been bestowed with great respect and honor. Two other little things that set the story up here is first off that Mary is betrothed or she has been promised in marriage to Joseph. This was probably something that their family set up. And the second thing is we are told that she is a virgin. This is something that will be emphasized several times throughout the story here because it's important for how all of this is about to take place. In verses 29 through 34, we have the promise that the angel makes to Mary. And there's several things that are important within this promise that we need to look at. Verse 30, so the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I have never been intimate with a man? First off, the angel says, don't be afraid. And this goes back to this idea that I was saying, that this isn't sort of like one of these pictures from Michelangelo. The fact that he had tells her not to be afraid really, I think, indicates that she was quite startled or scared by the appearance of this angel. The second thing is he repeats this idea that you have found favor with God, which we saw in the first section. The third thing is, is that the angel says that you will become pregnant or you will conceive in your womb. And the word that Gabriel uses here in the Greek is this idea of that you will have something come together in your womb. It's usually this idea of receiving or taking something from somebody else or putting something together, but then they used it metaphorically to talk about sort of the assembling or the, the baking or the weaving of a baby within the womb within the ancient world. The third thing is in that verse 32 and 33, we get sort of three promises that go back to 1 Samuel chapter 7 regarding God's promise to King David about the future heir of his that will sit upon the throne. The first thing he says is that this child of yours will be the son of the Most High. Now, in the Old Testament, when a king ascended to the throne, 
there was often sort of this adoption ritual where that king was then declared to be the son of God. However, in this instance here, it's not that it's a king that's going to be adopted as the son of God. This one will be the son of God from birth. The second thing is, is that the angel says that he will inherit the throne of his father David. Now, when that promise was made back in 1 Samuel chapter 7, that was over a thousand years ago. And any idea that this promise that someone would inherit the throne of the king of David would probably seem like sheer ludicrousness. It has been a thousand years, all sorts of tragedies have befallen the nation of Israel, and yet here the angel is saying is that now is the time that this promise will be fulfilled. And then the third thing is, is that the angel says his kingdom will have no end. And that directly flies in the face of what Israel has experienced throughout their history in the Hebrew scriptures. And then finally, this section closes with Mary giving an objection to the angel, where she says, how can this be? Because I have not known a man. How can this be? I can't do that. What do you mean? Who are you talking? You got the right person? The New English translation translates this as, I have not been intimate with the man. The ESV has, how can this be since I am a virgin? The idea here is the biblical idea of knowing someone, if you know what I mean. Verse 35, the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And look, your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son in her old age. Although she was called barren, she is now in her sixth month for nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. What's interesting in this story are the two verbs that are used here. In other words, they are used specifically to show the idea that this is not a sexual act here. There is something else taking place. The first one is, it says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And this coming upon someone in the Gospel of Luke is really the Holy Spirit overshadowing, empowering, taking control of someone's life. It's a spiritual act, not a physical one. The second idea here is this verb of overshadowing. And this is taken right out of Genesis. And when God separated the heavens and the seas in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And in the Greek translation there, they use the same idea that's translated as overshadowing here, that the Spirit of God is moving over the waters here. Now this brings across two ideas. First off, this is not a physical sexual act that they're talking about here. God is not descending from somewhere and then having sex with Mary and then going back to heaven, as we see in other ancient Near Eastern stories. The second thing is, is that by using these terms, Luke is really helping us to see that this is a new act of creation here. There is something new that's going to take place within Mary's womb that has not been done before. It has parallels with the Genesis 1 account of creation. I have a note here that I took from Father Raymond Brown's book, The Birth of the Messiah, and hopefully I'll remember to put a link to that on Amazon, so if you like that book, you can pick it up. It's a hefty piece of work, though. He says that the spirit which overshadows Mary is closer to the spirit of God that hovered over the waters before creation in Genesis 1-2. The earth was void and without form when that spirit appeared. Just so Mary's womb was void until the spirit of God filled it with a child who was his son. And finally, the angel gives Mary a confirmation or a sign. He says, look, your relative Elizabeth, and the, rel the word there, relative, is probably better translated as relative than cousin. Your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant with a son in her old age. Although she was called barren, she is now in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, Elizabeth's story is a lot like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. Mary's story is totally unique. There's really nothing that parallels Mary's account of a virgin, a young woman like that, conceiving a child without a man in the Old Testament. And then in verse 38, Mary replies, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. And we could translate that as, Behold, I am the slave of the Lord. But the word there for servant or slave, doulos, is in the female form, hey doulai. And so we could even translate this as, Behold, I am the female slave of the Lord. Now within Greco-Roman society, you had a hierarchy of individuals. 
a free landowning male was the highest within society. At the very lowest were the slaves, but the lowest of all the slaves was a female slave. This is what they referred to as to be twice cursed, to be a slave and to be a female. For Mary to use this term really shows that the fact that the angel has visited her and called her most favored one is not going to her head. In fact, the term that she uses to describe herself really places herself at the very lowest and most vulnerable level within society. She is a female slave. And then she says, let it be done according to your word. It shows that she has complete trust and submission to the word of the angel that's being announced to her. She becomes in this way, the model disciple for us to follow as well. Now, a few years ago, Matthew Morell wrote an excellent short book called Joseph's Dilemma, Honor Killing in the Birth Narrative of Matthew. And what he argues in there is that when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, this phrase that Matthew uses that Joseph tries to have Mary secretly put away was intended to protect her from the possibility of having her stoned for being pregnant outside of marriage. You've got the story in John where the woman is caught in adultery and then thrown down before Jesus and they want her to be stoned to death. Jesus replies, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. But remember at the very start of this video, I was talking about this poor young woman that was not allowed to graduate from her high school because she was immoral. These ideas of shame and sin run way back into the ancient world. And it really points to this idea that women bear the burden for sexual activity than men do, in particular when it is lab labeled as immoral or unacceptable by culture. The question here is within Mary's story when she says, Behold, the female slave of the Lord. She knows what's going on because remember she asks, How is this going to be? Because I have not been intimate with the man. In other words, I have lived my life right in the right way up until now. How is this going to take place? The second thing is, I think she knows very well what's going to happen if she is found to be pregnant. In Deuteronomy 22, we have laws regarding rape in the Old Testament. And it says that if a woman is raped within a city and she cries out, only the male perpetrator shall be stoned. But if she doesn't cry out, then both shall be stoned. But if a woman is in the countryside when she is attacked, then she is not to be stoned. Why? Because there's no possibility that anyone would have heard her crying out. Now, how does all this fit in Luke's story? Now, in verses 39 and 40, remember I said we're going to read a little bit further than the lectionary reading this week, we have Mary's reaction to the Annunciation. In those days, Mary got up and went hurriedly into the hill country to a town of Judah and entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. And then we have the whole story about, you know, John the Baptist jumping in the womb and all this sorts of stuff. But the key thing I want to bring out here is that Luke tells us that in those days, probably within a day or two of this Annunciation, with great haste, goes to Judah. Now from Nazareth down to some town within Judah here, it would have been probably a four to five day walk, 70 on the short end, maybe 90 plus miles on the long end to get down to Elizabeth's house. Now why would Luke tell us that Mary gets up and takes this journey by herself all the way down to see her, her relative, Elizabeth. Or to understand the biblical text, it's not just the words that we find in the text, but it's the culture, the geography, the history, the theology that lies behind the text that helps inform what's going on. And I think Deuteronomy chapter 22 informs Mary's actions here. Because let's think this through. If Mary had remained in Nazareth, it is only a short matter of time, matter of months, before she's going to start showing her pregnancy. It raises the very, very real possibility that Mary could be taken out and stoned for her pregnancy. A lot like that girl at the high school there. We're going to deny her the right to graduate because she's immoral. The same conclusion would have been reached in Mary's case, I think, as well. So her flight down to Judah becomes then not only a cover, people will not see her getting pregnant, but also when she returns back to Nazareth and they find that she's pregnant, 
is going to provide her with protection as well. Something could have happened in the roadside there. People wouldn't need to ask about it. They would realize that Mary's pregnant. They would realize that she's been on a journey and perhaps out of politeness, they may not have asked anything. And if they did ask something, perhaps her family would have then an excuse for why their daughter is pregnant. Yeah, yeah, I know she tells us these wild stories about angels and stuff like that, but she was also down there on the road by herself for a long amount of time as well. So the family would have a plausible explanation or cover for Mary's behavior. The only way that Mary can protect this pregnancy is the loophole that Deuteronomy 22 provides. She needs to be out in the countryside by herself and there cannot be any other witnesses to the fact that she didn't scream out or cry out for help. So Mary's hurried and frantic excursion down to see her relative Elizabeth not only confirms the promise to, that the angel Gabriel made to her, but it also protects her and the child that she is carrying as well. And these ideas about Mary fleeing down to see Elizabeth, they're not new to me. The, a number of scholars have brought this out as well. So in this short story that revolves around an angel making a promise to a young woman, and then her dialogue with the angel, and then her response to it, is really remarkable. On the angelic side, we have this incredible promise that the child she's going to carry is going to become the son of the Most High, he's going to be of the household of David, and that he is going to sit upon David's throne forever and ever. The second thing is, is that what's going to take place here with Mary's conception is really spectacular. It invokes themes from creation, Genesis 1-2 with the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, or God's Shekinah glory overshadowing the tabernacle with a cloud or a pillar of fire. The third, I think, most impressive thing that I find in this story is when Mary responds to all this with, Behold, the female slave of the Lord. Her submission to what the angel is announcing and asking and requiring of her is phenomenal. For a young woman who has no power or voice within that society and is really vulnerable to a great deal of threats to her life because of this, for her to stand up and say, I agree to this, is absolutely remarkable as she gives us a picture of what discipleship and being a follower of Jesus involves. And it's because of Mary's response that next week we are able to go into the observance and remembrance of Christmas, the incarnation or birth of Jesus. I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas, that you're able to focus upon the biblical account and story of Jesus' birth and not so much get caught up in the commercial consumerism that is part of our society today. Now, over here, I've got a link to my introductory video on Advent, which is really good for you to take a look. The link is down below as well. And down here is a link to last week's video. Until next week, may the peace of the Lord be with you richly.